more educational resources, like our medical ID cards, check out medicalbasics.com. In this next part, we're going to be talking about how to actually adjust our sliding scale insulin and specifically talking about the different types of dosing for insulin. In the first part, we talked very generally about all the different types of insulin as well as how sliding scale insulin works. In this one, we're going to talk about how to adjust it, the different types of dosing, and also how to change between the different types of insulin. And remember, this video is primarily catered towards students, medical students, or nursing students that just want a very broad overview of sliding scale insulin rather than actually how do we do all the intricate aspects of changing the dosing and whatnot. This is just going to give you a very general overview of how it may work. So let's get started. So the first thing is generally what are the different types of insulin? And we talked about this in the last video, so I'm going to touch on this very quickly is you have your basal insulin as well as your mealtime insulin. Right? And that's going to be consisting of your prandial as well as correctional. And that's going to be always before meals. And it's going to be all the short acting, whereas your basal is going to be all the long acting insulin. Normal glucose is anywhere from 70 to 100 for fasting and postprandial of less than 140 in a normal patient and 9 to 130 for fasting and postprandial of less than 180 for diabetic patients. So that's going to be our goal. And we're going to refer to this table quite a bit, and I'll show you why in a second. But essentially, this is going to be um, the insulin for a diabetic patient. And we'll see that every time they eat, every time they have a meal, their sugars are going to peak. If you have an individual that requires higher basal insulin needs, what would that look like? So this is an individual who is not getting enough basal insulin and you need to increase their basal insulin. So what would that look like in regards to their sugars? So their sugars may look something like this, where their average sugars are just going to be higher than what your goal is. So remember we said their goal was going to be somewhere between 90 and 130. These individuals are going to have their fasting sugars that are going to be higher as well as their average sugars that are just going to be higher than what we would need. So for these individuals, this is what their sugars may look like. If they're not getting enough basal insulin, we're going to want to increase their basal insulin. Their sugars overall are just very high, especially their fasting blood sugars are very high. It's going to be a little bit different for someone who only requires higher mealtime insulin. So what this is going to look like, these individuals who just aren't getting enough mealtime insulin, their fasting sugars are going to be just fine. And this is in the setting of taking things very discreetly. So let's say that their basal insulin is just at the perfect dosing, but they require more mealtime insulin than they are getting. So what their sugars may look like is something like this. So it just keeps going up and up, and then it'll, it'll eventually come down overnight. But in the morning time, their sugars are just fine, right? Their basal insulin is working, so their sugars overnight are perfectly fine. But then every time they eat, they have this peak, and it's just not taking it down. And you'll notice that it just keeps increasing and increasing. And that's because their mealtime insulin wasn't able to bring them back to their baseline. It wasn't able to bring them back all the way down here. And so they're, since they're up here, they're still going to have the same amount of increase after each meal. Let's say they're eating the same exact thing. They're going to have the same amount of increase, but they're not able to come back down to their baseline. So it's just going to keep rising, 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 and then it's going to have to wait until they get their basal insulin to kind of bring them back down. And that's kind of in the perfect model. That's how it would look like. But essentially, it's their mealtime insulin is not enough. It's going to look something like this. It's going to be every meal, their sugars are just going to go higher and higher, and their, their fasting sugar is perfectly fine. Their fasting sugars are right where you want it, but their mealtime postprandial sugars are just not where you want them to be. And then the final example is now you have an individual who's just having too low of sugars. They're having sugars that are very, very low and it can be dangerous. And this is for individuals that just are having too much basal insulin. So we need to decrease their basal insulin because we're dropping their sugars too much in the morning. So you can kind of think of it like this. Basal insulin is we're going to be looking at your fasting blood sugars. Your mealtime insulin, to see if it's the correct dosing, we're going to be looking at your postprandial sugars, right? So if you're having too high of sugars after meals, that means you're not having enough mealtime insulin, which is going to be your prandial and correctional insulin. 
if your fasting sugars are too high or too low, that's going to mean that your basal insulin is not at the correct dosing. So that's kind of the, the crudest way to think about it. Basal equals your fasting sugars. You look at your fasting sugars and your prandial correctional is going to be after meals, your postprandial sugars. So that's kind of a very general overview of, of how you're going to adjust your basal or more so when are you going to adjust your basal versus when are you going to adjust your mealtime insulin without getting too much into the nitty gritty of it, right? Because it's an art. It's an art of, of changing the insulin dosing. A lot of times you're just going to be adjusting um, things and just tweaking them along the way. And each month you're going to check in on them and see how their sugars are doing. But that's going to be kind of giving you as a medical student that you're looking at the endocrinologist and figure out how are they actually changing it? What, what is going into when are they going to change their basal insulin and when are they going to change the mealtime insulin? What went into that? Well, that's kind of how it works. Basal is going to be when you wake up, your fasting sugars and your postprandial um, sugars are going to be affecting your prandial and correctional insulin. The next thing is actual dosing, and this is just an example dosing, but we typically like to think of a diabetic type 1 patients as having them start off 0.5 units per kilogram per day for their basal insulin. And this is specifically basal insulin because prandial and correctional insulin is much more complicated, so I don't want to go into that. But for basal insulin, Diabetes type 1 patients are typically going to start them off by weight. It's all weight-based. So 0.5 units per kilogram per day and diabetic 2 are going to be start off at a lower dose because they still have some residual pancreatic function. So it's going to be a little bit lower. So that's how you kind of can remember it. But it's going to vary a lot. This is kind of where you start off. But you can imagine if you have a very obese patient, you have someone who's very resistant to insulin, this is going to be potentially a much, much higher dose. But this is what we typically like to start off patients, at least what I've been taught in practice. 0.2 for type 2 and 0.5 for type 1. And this is just a ballpark. When you actually do it in practice, it's going to be variable. And prandial correctional insulin is, is typically based on the patients. A lot more complicated, so I don't want to get into how we're going to be dosing that. And like I mentioned before, you're going to be adjusting it uh, with the patient specifically. So the next thing I want to talk about is actually how do we convert between the different types of basal insulin. So if you remember, there's different types of basal insulin that you can use. You can either use MPH or you can also use glargine. MPH is a, a BID dosing, uh, whereas glargine is, is one time per day. Um, and so typically we give glargine at nighttime and typically we give MPH two times. It could even be given three times a day. But if you want to convert someone from MPH to glargine, let's say the patient doesn't want to poke themselves as much or maybe they're not as well controlled on MPH and so we want to convert them over to glargine, how do you do that? So the answer is you do not just find out how much MPH they're given and just switch it over to glargine. What you have to do is you have to kind of go through this equation. It's very simple, but essentially you add up their entire MPH for the day and you multiply it by a conversion factor and that's the dosing that you're going to give to the patient. And the reason why you have this conversion factor and the most important part isn't what the conversion factor is, it's that it's less than one. Which means that let's say you required 10 units of NPH and you got that twice a day. In theory, that could be potentially 20 units of glargine that you could give because you gave 20 units of MPH during the day. And in theory, uh, because they act very similarly, MPH and glargine work this, essentially the same efficacy on your sugar, you would think, oh, you can just give 20 units of glargine at nighttime. Well, the reason why we don't is for a number of reasons. I think probably the most important reason is that you're giving this one time. Right? You're giving this one time, whereas you're splitting this up into two. You're splitting up MPH into two different dosing. And so if you were to give the equivalent dosing all at once, that's just going to tank the sugars. Right, The sugars are just going to drop too low. So we're going to want to multiply it by some type of conversion factor. And also you just want to give yourself some wiggle room. Whenever you're changing between one type of insulin to another, you never want to give identical amount uh, just because you don't know how they're going to react. It's much easier to correct for high sugars than to correct for low sugars. So those are the two reasons. One is you don't want to tank their sugars because you're going to give them the entire day of dosing in just one dosing with glargine. But also, you just don't know how they'll respond. It's much safer to give a lower dose because you can always increase the insulin. It's much harder to take away insulin, right? 
you're not going to die from high sugars for a couple of weeks. You will die with very low sugars just a few times. So that's kind of the risk benefit. So that's why we have this conversion factor is for those two reasons. So let's walk through an example. A patient takes MPH 10 units BID and wants to convert to glargine to reduce the number of pokes. So we kind of walked through this already, but let's say they have 10 units BID. So their 24 hour MPH requirement is going to be 20. And their conversion factor, let's say, is 0.8. So when we multiply these together, it's going to be 16. So they're going to take 16 units of glargine at nighttime. So that's how we can kind of convert between MPH to glargine. And there's similar ways that you can convert also the different types of short-acting insulin as well. I'm not going to talk about that here, but this kind of gives you a very simple view of how we actually change between the different types of insulin. Be sure to check out our website, medicalbasics.com, for more educational resources like our medical ID cards, scrub notes, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more tips and lessons.